What is a discourse community? Well, essentially, it's a learning environment where students actively engage in meaningful communication. And that means using the target language to interact, to collaborate, and build relationships. It's a space where every student's voice is valued and encouraged. Now, is that what you would like in your classroom? I'm guessing you're thinking, yes. But how do we create this space for our students? Well, in this episode, I will give you five key strategies for building a discourse community in your classroom. So let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome to the World Language Classroom Podcast. I am Joshua Cabral, and thank you, as always, for being here with me, for being that great teacher that goes that little extra mile to listen to a podcast about language teaching. So thank you so much for doing that. So we are well into our new school year now. So last week, you got to hear about my experience in Nicaragua and that whole story. But this week, we are back to looking really closely at our classrooms. Now, before we jump into our specific topic of discourse communities and creating discourse communities today, I want to make sure that you download the CI toolbox, which is in the show notes. You can also get it at wlclassroom.com slash toolbox, or the link is right in the show notes. So what I did is I listened back over a lot of episodes and looked at all of my notes from my guests and things that I've shared with you. And I took 15 comprehensible input activities for your language classroom, and I put them together in one document. And these suggestions are a compilation of ideas shared on the World Language Classroom podcast by me and many guests over the last couple of years. But I know that as different people are sharing out different things, that you hear it, and sometimes it's in the show notes, or they say, go to my blog. But what I did is I took them all, and I put them in one document that you can download for free, by the way, and it is in the show notes or also at wlclassroom.com slash toolbox. So in this episode, we'll discuss the importance of creating a discourse community in your classroom, and I'm going to share practical strategies, five of them, to foster that environment where students feel comfortable communicating and collaborating in the target language. Now, this idea of creating a classroom discourse community is what we refer to as a high leverage teaching practice. So building a classroom discourse community is considered a high leverage teaching practice because it directly impacts student engagement and language proficiency because it creates this supportive environment where students can take risks, make mistakes, and learn from one another. Now, this concept of high leverage teaching practices comes from the work of Eileen Glisson and Richard Donato, and their book from 2020, Enacting the Work of Language Instruction, offers six high leverage teaching practices. And so this idea of creating a discourse community is one of those practices. So we're going to break down this topic into five strategies, each with concrete tips that I'll give you as well as examples to help you build that vibrant discourse community in your classroom. So let's make sure that we understand exactly what we're talking about when we say this idea of a discourse community. So a classroom discourse community is a learning environment where students actively engage in meaningful communication. So that means that they are using the target language to interact with each other. They're using it to collaborate and to build relationships. It is that space where every student's voice is valued and encouraged. Creating a discourse community is essential for language acquisition because it provides that authentic opportunity or many authentic opportunities for students to practice and develop their language skills. 
And it's also going to foster a sense of belonging and motivation, you know, as students feel more connected and invested in their learning. So again, as I asked you at the very beginning, is that what you want in your classroom? Yes, right? Of course, we all want that. So let's get into the strategies for creating that situation, that environment in our classroom where students are feeling very connected to the language and each other and to their communication with the language. So the first strategy is to establish norms and expectations. Now, some of these you might be doing already, but just think about it in a different way or get some confirmation that you're doing that. But when it comes to a community, we want to start by establishing norms and expectations because setting clear norms and expectations helps to create a safe and respectful environment where students feel comfortable participating. It establishes the foundation for productive discourse. So here are some tips for making that happen in your classroom. The first thing is to involve students in creating the norms because that's gonna give them ownership and accountability. So discuss what respectful communication looks like and why it's important. And then clearly outline those expectations for participation, or for turn-taking, or for active listening, and maybe even have some visual aids and posters in the classroom to reinforce these norms. Again, making sure that it's transparent, that you're actually not assuming that they know what it's like to participate in this environment, and how to take turns, and, and how to listen actively. We have to clearly outline those expectations for participation. And as the year goes on, we want to regularly revisit to reinforce those norms because that is what's going to ensure that they remain effective and relevant. An example of this might be at the beginning of the school year, and even if you're a couple of weeks in, you know, take some time, maybe even do this now, But at the beginning of the school year, you could have a class discussion to create a list of communication norms. For for example, you could say one person speaks at a time and the others are listening actively. And that means respect different opinions and maybe even post these norms in your classroom and refer to them as needed. So this is a really important starting point is to establish those norms and expectations because as things do not go as hopeful fully planned, you can kind of come back to these and look at them and say, oh, are we following the expectations and norms for our community, our discourse community that we all created together? Because by involving students in it, that's where the ownership comes in. And it's not very top down from the teacher. So strategy number two for creating this discourse community is encouraging students to interact with each other in meaningful ways. That's going to help build a sense of community and improve their language skills. So peer interaction provides authentic opportunities for language use. So interacting with each other. So that means beyond teacher asks a question, student gives an answer, and it just goes back and forth that way, but having students interact with each other. So use pair and group activities to facilitate that interaction and structure these activities to ensure that every student has the chance to speak and contribute. And then you can incorporate cooperative learning strategies such as, you know, think, pair, share or jigsaws or peer teaching so you can promote that collaboration as well. And creating opportunities for students to share their work and give feedback to each other. This helps build confidence and improve their communication skills. So an example might be using a think, pair, share activity where students first think about a question individually or a concept. Then they discuss their thoughts with a partner and then finally share their ideas to the class. So this structure ensures that all students have the chance to participate. So even thinking of some of those participation techniques that you have in your classroom and are they set up so that students are not just having an opportunity to show their understanding and raise their hand and answer teacher questions, but you have activities set up where they're interacting with each other. So strategy number three is to use authentic and meaningful tasks. 
So authentic tasks are activities that have real world relevance and purpose. So they engage students by connecting language learning to their personal interests and experiences. It's what's relevant to them. It's what they want to be learning about. It's what they want to be writing about or watching a video about. So it is purposeful because it is relevant and specific to their interests. So this means designing tasks that require students to use the target language in practical real life situations. This could include role plays, simulation, project-based learning, again, on topics of interest to them. And you can incorporate students' interests and cultural backgrounds into the task to make it more engaging and meaningful. That cultural background, that lived identity of students is huge in terms of windows and mirrors and cultural competence as well. And use tasks that require problem solving and even critical thinking and creativity because that's going to encourage deeper engagement. So an example might be creating a project where students plan a trip to a country where the target language is spoken, and they can research the destinations, create their own itineraries, and present their plans to the class in the target language. But the most important thing is they are not going to places that we tell them they're going to go to and learn about. But what are the things you would want to see? What are the things you would want to do while you're there? Would you want to go to a baseball game to see what it looks like when it happens in that country? Would you want to go to a safari? Would you like to go to a park? Would you like to go to a museum? Do you want to spend most of your time in restaurants? Do you want to do things where you're engaging more directly with the community? Do you want to do service work while you're there? So again, Anything that the student wants to do while they're there, because it's personal to them, that's where that vested interest is going to come in. And that's what's going to help to make sure that it's an authentic and meaningful task. And then when they talk about it and they discuss it and they ask their friends about it, that's contributing to that discourse community because of that idea of the relevance that's in there. And strategy number four is to encourage reflective practice with our students. Reflective practice involves students thinking about their learning experiences and the language that they use because this helps them become more aware of their progress and areas of improvement. Start with goal setting, particularly early in the year, and revisit them. Look at your can-do statements for a particular unit or for the entire year and have students reflect on their own progress toward achieving or meeting those can-do statements. So incorporate regular reflection activities. This could include journals or learning logs and self-assessment checklists or reflections on their goal setting. But facilitate class discussions where students share their reflections and learn from each other's experiences. So you would likely want to provide prompts that guide students to think about what they've learned, what challenges they've faced, and how they can improve. This is very much a meta way of looking at it, but students aren't always going to be talking about what their challenge areas are. But when they have a time to reflect, and maybe it's even done through an artistic way or a journaling way or something like that, but they have that opportunity to approach it from that personal place and to see about their own learning. So an example of how you might go about this is at the end of each week, in the last class of the week, the last five or 10 minutes, have students write a journal entry reflecting on what they learned, what they found challenging, and how they plan to overcome those challenges. If it's a higher proficiency level, have them do it in the target language. If it's a lower proficiency level, have them reflect in the language they're most comfortable with. But encourage them to share their reflections with you, and you might even have them do it in small groups because they might hear that other students are in a similar situation as they are. Or they could even suggest to their classmates how they overcame some challenge area in a way that we as teachers may not have thought about. So having that opportunity for reflection on the learning is going to, again, create that safe space, that risk-taking, 
and to keep it productive in terms of seeing where the challenge areas are and not just labeling it and then keeping it there. And then strategy number five is to model effective communication. As a teacher, modeling effective communication sets the standard for your students. Demonstrating active listening or respectful discourse and conversations and clear expression when you're speaking shows students how to engage in meaningful interactions. We are the model of that that students are seeing. So one possibility is to use think alouds to show your thought process when you're communicating in the target language. So you can see, oh, I don't know this word, so I'm going to think around it. I'm going to use other words where you're modeling circumlocution and explain why you choose certain words to students. Again, getting a little meta, but it's those things that we can do where we're modeling to students how we are engaging with the language so that we are modeling that effective communication. And model active listening by paraphrasing students' responses and asking follow-up questions and providing feedback. And then demonstrate how to handle disagreements and differing opinions respectfully. That's going to help to foster that classroom culture of open dialogue. So if we're always doing things in a way where we're not giving a model to students, that we're always way above their proficiency level, but sometimes we can do things sort of at their proficiency level so that they can see those examples of how we are working with the language as well. So an example of going about that might be during a class discussion, model active listening by repeating and paraphrasing what a student has said before you respond to it. This shows that you value their contribution, and it could encourage others to listen attentively. You could even have other students do the paraphrase of what other students are saying to show their understanding before they engage in a response. Sometimes we jump to the response and we haven't checked for understanding, but that is going to help them to engage in that act of listening when they're paraphrasing back. So when we look at this idea of a classroom discourse community, so we looked at it from five key strategies for building that discourse community. The first one we looked at was establishing norms to make sure that students are involved, that they have agency, that they are part of constructing the norms of the classroom. So what does it mean to be an active listener? What does it mean to not talk over each other? What does it mean to respond appropriately? What happens when we have disagreement, but we have norms that are built in the classroom? Because it's not just using the language in the classroom and discourse. Remember, it is a community. And so we have to make sure we're establishing those norms and those expectations. And then number two, we looked at promoting student interaction, that it's not just teacher asks a question and student answers, and that's the only interaction that's happening, but we're setting up those activities and scenarios where students are interacting with each other. Then we're using authentic and meaningful tasks, making sure that we're keeping topics relevant, not just the topics, but how students are engaging with it. Are they writing social media posts? Are they writing a text in a way that they're engaging with the content in a way that's relevant to them? So number one was establish those norms. Number two is promoting those student interactions as well as with the teacher. Number three, authentic and meaningful tasks that are relevant. Then number four, Four was about reflective practice and having students think about their own learning and to find some way of journaling about it or communicating and talking about what has been successful, what's been challenging, and some tools for overcoming that. And then number five, we looked at modeling effective communication. And that is on us as teachers to model to students, this is how you handle something if you don't know the word. This is the way that you handle a disagreement. This is how you listen actively as someone is speaking. This is how you wait your turn before jumping over or allowing others to have a spot as well. So you have those five tools there, those strategies that you can use there. So when you're implementing all of those, that the goal is to create that discourse community in your classroom, and it takes time and consistent effort 
but I guarantee you that the rewards are well worth it. When students feel connected and engaged, their language skills and confidence will grow. So I definitely encourage you to try implementing maybe one or two of these strategies in your classroom this week. Try not to do everything together because it can get very overwhelming, but try one or two. If you don't have norms and expectations, try starting there or creating tasks where students are interacting with each other and it's not just teacher question and answer. But choose one of them and give it a try this week and then observe how your students respond and adapt and then look at it and change it up and do what you need to to make sure that it fits your needs. And we would always love to know how that's going for you, so be sure to share that out on social media and tag WL Classroom so we can all be a part of that conversation. Love to know how that's going for you. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there is the CI Toolbox, so be sure to download the CI Toolbox in the show notes. It is also at wlclassroom.com slash toolbox, and that's 15 CI activities for your language classroom to support comprehension and authentic engagement. Remember, these are all strategies that were shared on the podcast, either by guests or by me, all in one place that you can have it there. You'll also see in the show notes a link to sign up for Talking Points, which is my weekly email newsletter with tips and resources for language teaching. And there are also links to get in touch with me if you would like to work together. And remember, we can do that in person in your school, or we can do it remotely, either synchronously or asynchronously. Remember those words? (laughs) I will talk to you soon. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the World Language Classroom podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so that you never miss an episode. Let's keep the conversation going on social media. Connect with me on X, aka Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at WL Classroom. And for even more valuable resources, visit my website, wlclassroom.com, where you'll find over 300 blog posts about language teaching. So stay inspired, keep growing, and continue making a difference in your language classroom.